so we are live, but uh, what I want to do is give give a few minutes here for a few more people to jump on some of our attendees. Looks like the number is going up, which is nice, and then we'll we'll get into starting the webinar. I can get started even quick. A lot of people joined in right on time. I love that. Yeah, we might as well go ahead and get started. Uh, I'll first start off by, by introducing myself. My name is Ryan Chacon um, with IoT for All. Um, IoT for All, for those of you who are unfamiliar, we are the leading destination for all things IoT. Our goal is to focus on making IoT accessible to everyone by connecting buyers and sellers, providing expert guidance, support, organizing all that types of content in one place to, to help everybody connected to the IoT industry in one form or another. Um, but I do want to start here by just thanking everybody, all these attendees, all of our panelists for being here today to learn about why 75% of IoT projects fail and how to avoid those problems. And this um, webinar is brought to you by uh, our partner, SoftTech. Um, we have a number of members of the SoftTech team here today that I'll let them introduce themselves in a second. But first, let me just talk a little bit more about the purpose of this webinar. Uh, to make sure we're all kind of on the same page is to share some of the most important considerations for early IoT development and how to avoid becoming one of those 75% of deployments that really never make it to market. Uh, just keep in mind for our audience, everyone out there, we do have question and answer at the end. There is a button at the bottom of the Zoom um, player that says Q&A, so please use that to submit questions. We'll be able to collect them, ask questions at the end, get them answered by our experts here. The chat function is more so to engage with the attendees, talk with the attendees, share kinds of information on that side of things. But specific questions for our experts that you have throughout the show, please uh, use the Q&A feature to make that more efficient for us. Um, all right, so let's start off by introducing the true experts here, the ones who are great sure. time out of their day to share their insights in the world of IoT development and you know how we can help avoid those common problems and success in Kind of achieve best in our IoT journey. Um, so we're going to explore those examples of types of failures our speakers have seen, identify the root causes, and have some really good discussion today is the goal. Our, our panel today has over 75 years of combined experience in planning and developing complex systems involved in connected devices. So with that being said, I want to bring in Chris Howard, the founder and C CEO of SoftTech, to talk a little bit more about himself, SoftTech as a company, and then we'll throw it around to the other panelists. So Chris, please feel free to start and I'll share my screen to show some, uh, some information about SoftTech. All right, great, thanks Ryan. Yeah, as Ryan said, my name is uh, Chris Howard. I'm the founder and CEO of SoftTech Development. I started in this industry at IBM supporting NASA with the very first PC. So it's been really amazing to see how this industry has grown over time. Um, we're headquartered in Houston, Texas with offices in Minsk and Munich. Um, I founded SoftTech 23 years ago with a focus on technical software development, meaning I wanted to use technology to solve the more complex hardware and software development projects. So we call ourselves a full stack development company. And what that means is we have all the parts and pieces that you need to do um, an IoT project, all the way from design of the hardware to the embedded firmware, to the mobile apps and the cloud and backend and the QA. So uh, just some fast facts here. Uh, we're headquartered in Houston, as I mentioned. Uh, we have our client delivery center in Munich, uh, R&D center in Minsk with over 300 people there and sales offices both in Los Angeles and Amsterdam. So we've been around for a while now. <laughs> That's great, thanks for sharing that. Let's uh, throw it over to, let's have, let's have Jeremy and Mike from SoftTech talk a little bit more about themselves and then we'll bring Danny in uh, to discuss kind of his connection and uh, to, the, to the webinar and you know, his, himself working over there at Microsoft. Sure, uh, thank you. Um, hi everybody, this is Jeremy McKeon. Uh, I've been with SoftTech now for about six months. Um, I've been working uh, in the technology space for more than 20 years, including the last 10 years focused a lot on IoT uh, specifically at EMC, working with other companies like GE and other large uh, global corporations in the oil and gas and industrial manufacturing space and helping guide them towards enhanced decision-making capabilities using IoT and, and AI and machine learning capabilities. And really happy to be joining this seminar. Thank you. Great. Mike? 
Hi, my name is Mike Park. I'm solutions architect at Softac. Um, I work there for more than a year now. So my main goal is to understand the customer goals, business goals, and to make them happen in, from the technical perspective. So I have uh, 12, or 12 plus years of experience, uh, mainly in the cloud and backend development. Also, I have like a huge, a huge experience in the IoT projects uh, and with the all related technology over there. Fantastic. Danny? Yes, hi. So Dan Danny Diaz, I am a uh, solutions architect currently at um, uh, Microsoft, uh, part of our global black belt team. Um, soon to uh to get to lead the team uh, of uh solutions architect that that focus on on, on iot um been uh, working for iot now with iot now for about five years uh or so um and uh, prior to that uh, about 15 years in, in software development and um and yeah solution architecture great thanks you all for uh, for that information I'll help our audience a ton kind of understanding who they're talking to today um, but all right, let's set the stage for today's discussion. So one of the things I think I wanted to lead with here was that we all know that IoT is becoming a key element for digital transformation across businesses across all different industries, right? Um, connected device development and the development of solutions is very complex. And for successful imp implementation and integrating IoT into a business is definitely easier said than done. And as we mentioned earlier, we are going to explore examples of types of those failures that our speakers have seen and identify those root causes. But first, what I wanted to do was talk a little bit more about IoT itself. At a high level, the reason why IoT can be seen as a very challenging industry to be a part of, a challenging kind of journey to go down for companies as they start this IoT journey. So depending on who you ask, there are definitely a variety of reasons IoT can be challenging. And to start off our discussion, I wanted to bring Chris in to talk about two of those um, very challenging elements of IoT itself. The first has to do more with the fragmentation of the IoT market. And the second is how IoT in general as a technology kind of group is very complex. There's obviously a lack of knowledge out there. It requires you to know a lot about different things from hardware to connectivity to the cloud to user interface. All across the board, that knowledge is very, can be very difficult for people to understand at times. So Chris, what I want to do is have you kind of just talk a little bit more about your experiences in the industry relating around the complexity of IoT and why it kind of sets itself up for people to come across challenges more easily due to, again, the fragmentation of the market itself and the supply chain and the complexity that IoT just has by nature of itself. Right. Yeah, I mean, as far as fragmentation, I mean, we talk about IoT, you can really be talking about almost any industry nowadays, right? So you've got wearables, you've got uh, healthcare, you've got industrial IoT, you have just about any area that you could uh, uh, use an IoT device for digital transformation and some of these other areas. Um, it's, very, it's very broad and so you really do need to have a wide range of expertise uh, across a lot of different domains, right? Um, so it's not just about the device. And, you know, when you look at an IoT device, a lot of people think, oh, well, it's just this, you know, cute little device or something. They're, they're small little devices, so it should be an easy project to do, right? But they're actually deceptively simple because um, the reality is that there's just a wide and diverse range of technical skills and expertise that you need from hardware design, mechanical design, electrical engineering, wireless technology, firmware, mobile, web backend, QA, all of that. And then you add security and support and even AI now on top of that with machine learning. It just uh, really does require a you know, full stack approach and a wide amount of experience. Absolutely. I think one of the things we talk a lot about in, at IoT for All and our podcasts and a lot of our other um, channels is the importance of partnerships, the importance of understanding that you as a company, whether you are looking to build a solution to deploy your, for your own business or for potential customers, is you don't actually need to know and understand every component of an IoT solution yourself. The idea is that IoT is a very partnership-centric ecosystem. Can you talk a little bit about your experiences kind of at SoftTech working with other companies to build solutions for customers and kind of how that plays into the, the success of an overall IoT journey? 
Right. Yeah. So in a lot of cases, when a customer is approaching us, you know, they have a particular business need, right? And not really a, 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 a good, maybe necessarily a good grasp of what it's going to take in order to implement that, that business uh, need, right? right. So uh, what we do is come in as a partner to help, you know, scope that out, you know, to, so they really understand kind of the level of involvement and the amount of development in order to really succeed in, in the project that they're, that they're wanting to implement uh, and, and solve. Absolutely. Now, Danny, Mike, and Jeremy, we are chiming in here for a second, just talking about what you all see kind of in relation to what Chris was just saying. Um, as it connects to the complexity of IoT from your own perspective of your own roles that are obviously a little bit different than where Chris is sitting at times? Yeah, I mean, I think the ecosystem point is a really big point. Um, there's so many different capabilities out there, different devices that have that apply to different use cases. Um, IoT is definitely a use case kind of driven, like many things in technology, capability. Um, to say sensor, a lot of people use that term as what does that sensor need to do? Uh, you know, is it need Wi-Fi? Is it or is it uh, LTE or or 5G connected? Do I need that? Why do I need that? Um, do I need an accelerometer? What type of sensor? What what do I need? And these are all kind of things that that need to be thought through. And and you know, typically there's not one supplier to to rule them all. In this it's really uh, you need to integrate a disp disparate set of capabilities that are represented within that ecosystem to solve a given problem. Um, and, and the same thing goes with the interpretation. One's the data acquisition, then there's the interpretation of that data, right? So how do, what tools do I use to interpret the data I'm actually gathering? And there's another ecosystem for that. You know, and the BI tools like Microsoft Power BI is a great one, right? So these are all different kind of things you need to think about in terms of what ecosystem do I need to bring to bear to solve what types of problems. Absolutely. And D Danny, what are you seeing from uh, your side over there at Microsoft? Yeah, no, so, so if you think about that, um, all the different people that have to come into in place to to basically create this, uh, these solutions, you're talking about multiple departments, uh, multiple responsibilities. Um, so it's not one team creating the solution. It, it really requires, even within the enterprise, partnership uh, within it. Uh, which uh, at times could be more challenging than bringing in a partner to, to, to do it all. Uh, so it's definitely something that, 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 we, that we see um, uh, multiple times uh, when working on projects. Absolutely. Mike, anything there to add before we finish up and kind of transition to it? Yeah, not really much to be added. So I guess everybody <laughs> said pretty much of that. So my only point over here could be like, uh, sometimes people uh, who, who want to build the IoT project they are not really understanding what they want, even from the business goal perspective. Uh, they just look at some example and say, okay, this seems like my case. And I believe that if I will be adding Bluetooth in there, it will be just a perfect fit for market, but without even really understanding why do they need Bluetooth in there and what's the main goal of their application in the end. Absolutely. Yeah, I think all those opinions are, are, are very accurate and very important for our audience to understand because our goal here is not to scare you away from IoT because of the complexity. It's to make you understand that, that the experts in the industry understand the complexity and are there to help. You know, trying to do this yourself in-house is not an easy task, nor does anyone really advise you of doing that. So working with, with partners and other companies who can help bring your IoT solution um, kind of to market or... Um, just to reality to solve your company's problems, I think is a very important thing to keep in mind. So what I'd like to do is now transition into more specific kind of conversation around why IoT projects fail or stall after they get started. So now that we kind of understand a, the high level why, why reasons on why IoT can be challenging, let's dive into those projects themselves and why they fail. So as you can imagine, there are a variety of reasons that this could happen. And for the sake of time, let's focus on just a few of those um, in more of a common stage uh, or a common early stages of an IoT journey. So the pilot, the proof of concept stages. So we're talking about technical challenge, lack of knowledge, the cost to move past pilot into scale can be daunting. The ROI or the business value may not be realized early on and may take time. So that could deter projects from moving past the pilot stage you know, getting stakeholder buy-in, lack of a clear strategy. There's tons of reasons on why projects do not make it past the planning or even past the pilot and the proof of concept stage. 
So what I'd like to do is kind of just go around the group again and just talk a little bit more specifically on some of the leading causes that you've seen that are not allowing these projects that probably are very promising to get out of that first um, kind of pilot or proof of concept stage. And from there, what I want to do is focus on some of the bigger ones and have a more detailed discussion. So, so just to kind of get us started, let's, let's go ahead and start with Jeremy here. Jeremy, can you just talk a little bit more about specifics on some of the things you've seen from your side of things on why IoT projects oftentimes do not make it out of that pilot or proof of concept phase? I mean, it starts with planning. Uh, when you're planning to do a project, a lot of companies, um, you know, decide, hey, we need to we need to get more information, um, and, and you know, to optimize a certain process or or to 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 help make decisions. Um, they, they, what they often a lot of times fail to do is kind of make sure they understand the nature of the business problem they're trying to solve, to quantify the nature of that problem from a business impact standpoint. So they can then back into, okay, we have a problem that's roughly worth a million dollars. Sure. Probably doesn't make sense to spend $5 million on an IOT solution. So how do you, cause you know, IOT solutions can cost, you know, have a wide range of, of cost variables due to the complexity. And so it's really important to understand what business problem you're trying to solve. Mm -hmm. What questions are you trying to answer essentially? So this problem can be formed into a question. Um, you know, given an increase in production of X percent, what does that mean for me from a revenue standpoint? What's the impact on my supply chain? What's the impact on my distribution channels? These types of questions. Then well, what, what types of data do I need to capture in terms of just answer those questions? What are the variables? Mm -hmm. Then, you know, so start with the business problem first and work your way backwards from there versus, you know, hey, we've got, you know, all this technology, let's figure something out to do with it. And I found that if you work from the business problem backwards, you typically end up with a lot more robust solution with business buy-in from the business than you do if you work from the technology up. Absolutely. And again, if you, if you, with that business buy-in, making sure you have those KPIs, those business metrics, the quantification of the, the problem, um, those are all really important elements that sometimes get overlooked in a rush to do a proof of concept, for instance. And I think proofs of concepts themselves represent a problem because they typically look at a small problem and don't look at the scaling element and go beyond that, you know, plan past that proof of concept. So you may budget $25,000 for a POC and find out it's going to cost you $2 million to scale it. Look ahead, figure out what that, you know, try as much as you can to estimate what that cost of scaling is going to be so you're not surprised. And then obviously if you have that business impact uh, quantification done up front, then you can start making some decisions. Absolutely. Chris, what are your thoughts there with that? Yeah, I mean, definitely, definitely having an iterative approach where you're um, you're doing your planning and your in your research uh, mm -hmm. in in phases, right? So um, it's uh, you know whether you're doing the proof of concept and MVP, you know, you, you definitely need those in order to you know uh, understand what your your technology roadblocks might be, right? Is this thing even possible to do? But to Jeremy's point, you also have to be looking ahead to, you know, what does it look like at a, at a mass scale? And, um, you know, once, once you do get, um, you know, your design completed and validated and now you, you feel like you do have product market fit, what does it, what does it look like when you, when you're going to scale it? Yeah. And, and oftentimes that is a very difficult thing to fully project out, but it's very important to understand that as early on as possible because venturing down that path and seeing that, hopefully success in that pilot phase of, of a deployment um, can be very encouraging to hopefully move into scale. But if, if it hasn't been built early enough, early on, or the thought hasn't been there to put the pieces together to really show that ROI from a cost perspective, it's going to be then hard to get that, that buy-in from, from stakeholders within the company. And Danny, could you kind of touch a little bit more on that part? Um, I know um, there's probably a, a different viewpoint coming from Microsoft on things you've seen when it comes to getting that stakeholder buying there yeah yeah but perhaps uh, you know one of the things that we are always looking for uh, when we get engaged in a project is uh, you know does the idea does the initiative have executive sponsorship uh, mm -hmm. we, we already established earlier that these projects could be complex um, you know they it, it could take multiple teams to um, uh, to put it through uh, to you know you need everything from embedded engineers to hardware designers uh, then there's the uh, on the cloud application side, and you have um, other things to worry about, 
when it comes to data and security and deployment, it, it, it can be pretty complex. So uh, you're going to hit hurdles uh, constantly. And unless you have that, that solid sponsorship that you can go to uh, when you need more time or, or when budget uh, uh, needs to be adjusted, um, we, we will typically see those projects just, they, they may not fail completely, but they definitely get deprioritized. And, 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 and at the end of the day, they never see the value that they were initially thought that they, they could realize from it. Right. And I, I want to stay on this topic for a second, because I want to transition our conversation a little bit more to focusing on really big root causes that we see when developing IoT projects. And before we do that, Danny, I want to keep you in for this section. Uh, I want to let our audience know that I'm going to um, start a poll. Uh, I think we can, you should be able to see it within Zoom. The idea here, let me go and start it. The question we're going to ask is when developing an IoT project, which issue is most concerned, which is most of a concern for you? And what we'll do is we'll collect those responses. And at the end, before question and answer, we'll, we'll look, about, look into them a bit more, see what the results are and discuss as a group. So I'm going to go ahead and launch that poll now. Feel free to vote um, uh, when, you know, as you think through it and, and, and uh, come up with an answer there, and then we'll discuss it shortly. But Danny, let's talk about one of the main root causes that we've seen um, to, to, to dive a bit deeper into, and that's the failure to establish a business case. And it connects to what we were just talking about around the um, stakeholder buy-in, establishing the, the ROI, um, ties into what Jeremy was mentioning is about thinking about the business case first and moving backwards. So can you talk a little bit more about the importance of the business case, explain, you know, kind of what it means when we're thinking about business case and why it's so oftentimes a potential issue and kind of the mistakes you see when people are thinking through that phase? Yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, uh, one of the biggest misconceptions that I see is that uh, people think that a business case requires some sort of an ROI, right? Mm -hmm. That if I invest X amount, I'm going to get X or Y. Um, and, and that's not the case. Uh, many times companies are embarking in IoT as a, as a way to, uh, you know, to develop a certain skill sets within their organization, you know, to be able to get, you know, gain visibility into, right. into the way the, the operation uh, is going. So it's not necessarily always a, if I invest X, I'm going to get Y. Uh, it's a little more complex uh, of, a, of a question. So the first thing is, you know, is just that, it's understanding what, why, what is it that you're trying to gain? Mm -hmm. Is it a new market that you're going after as a new product development? Uh, perhaps it's just uh, to optimize your operations. So, so you need to, to be very clear as to, you know, what is the end goal here? Why am I investing uh, resources? Why am I, uh, you know, putting time into this? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, we have, we get, um, we don't see this as much now. Uh, I used to see this a lot, you know, maybe three years ago, two years ago, where companies would just go in blindly just to try it. Okay. Right. And they will, you know, they will, want us to come in and, and invest on a project to monitor a, you know, five conference rooms just because they wanted to get into IOT. And it's like, well, that's not really, I mean, that, that's a science project that, that, that could be handled over a weekend. Um, but that's not really a reason to get into IOT. You know, what, what is a, a true business requirement that you have? For instance, uh, is your compet are your competitors uh, embracing IOT? Or do you understand that your operations are, are, uh, could be optimized some and, and you want to prove it so that you can have a better business case or you know you understand that your that your industry could benefit from from some sort of um, iotization uh, of your product right so so you know have a real business uh, 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 target that you can feel comfortable selling to your executive suite um, and, and and that gives you that 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 buy-in right once once you have the business need and you can articulate it then you can kind of turn it around and get the buy-in that you need. Right. Yeah. That, that kind of ties into my, my follow-up question, which is going to be how to get that leadership or that executive buy-in. So what advice do you have for those out there who are looking to better define their business case to not only start that IoT journey, but also to then help them with the process of getting the buy-in from the, the leadership or the executives that will help not maybe, you know, either launch the pilot or after the pilot, get up, you know, get the funding together to go to scale. What advice do you have there? Yeah, you know, one of the things that we tell our customers all the time is, you know, think big. Uh, I think it was Jeremy who talked about, uh, you know, you can start a POC that, that, that will cost you $25,000, uh, $25, but to, to scale, it's going to be $2 million, right? Um, it's okay to start, to, to, to start small though, right? So, I mean, you can think with that scaled in, in, in mind of, this is going to cost me 
X to get there, but you can start small uh, and maybe, maybe prove it out that way. Uh, started as a, as a scrum work kind of a project, if you will. Um, uh, we, we, we see that to be successful uh, with, with customers to, to be able to have some data points that they can then take into the executive suite to say, hey, you know, we, we tried this for six weeks mm -hmm. uh, and this is the uh, response that we got from our customers. I think we should invest on it. Um, do your research, right? Uh, there's, there's tons of research available now uh, as to, you know, how, how IoT can improve your operations or how can uh, generate a new revenue, uh, line of revenue for you. And, you know, start, start with a small POC, but don't, don't think of it as a POC though, right? Change the, the, the I know it's just it's semantics, but uh, think of it as a pilot, mm -hmm. right? A POC can be thrown away. A pilot is going to get it implemented even if with just a few customers. So think, think I am going to show this to a couple of customers, in, internal or ex external. I'm going to get some feedback, and then I'm going to adjust my approach or go in and, and, and ask for the, for the sponsorship that I need. Absolutely. I think that's a great kind of discrepancy. We, we oftentimes use the terminology POC and pilot kind of interchangeably, but as you just mentioned, a POC can be seen as something that can be thrown away. A pilot is really taking that first commitment or that first step to get started to hopefully build something of value for your company. And Chris, I wanted to bring you in here for a second and just ask from the soft tech side of things, what, what kind of discussions do you have with, with customers around that same kind of area about establishing that business, business case and what advice do you provide them to help do that efficiently? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, as, uh, as geeks, it's really easy to get excited by the technology, which is why this point, I think, is pretty important because uh, it's a blind spot for a lot of companies to kind of get that business support because you can go to the work of solving all these technical problems and, and then uh, you're kind of dead on arrival. Um, POC or proof of concept allows you to kind of get through some of those technology problems. Um, we've also seen the opposite where guys want to kind of almost skip that proof of concept and go right to trying to create a version 3.0 product with everything but the kitchen sink thrown in it and uh, it makes the project overly complex. And what we try to do is just uh, get in there with our business analysts and try to dig in a little bit and ask these types of questions of like what kind of problem they're trying to solve, what does success look like, um, you know, uh, just to kind of make sure they've thought about all the angles and then trying to guide them toward this, you know, iterative process of, you know, proof of concepts and uh, while thinking about the big, the big picture as well. Absolutely. Now, I want, to, I want to keep you here for a second and ask um, kind of the second root cause I wanted to focus on is the failure to assemble a proper team, which can kind of relate to what we're talking about is we've established that business case and we're getting the buy in, but you need it, you know, is it the team? It's either a team internally, um, it's working with partners or working with a company and their partners to, to understand what's needed to go into the development. So, based on on partnerships, you know, you really need to decide how to how technical the team needs to be, whether you have those resources in house, you need to get them or, or just partner with somebody, right? So how, how do you um, kind of assemble the right skills and how just how like our distributed teams often required, but sometimes difficult to manage. So what are those common problems associated with assembling the proper team, whether it's like I said, in house, or it's external, or it's a combination of the two? Um, and how can teams kind of better handle this? Um, and then again, tying in the partnerships, so it's a, probably a key aspect there. Yeah. Well, I mean, it depends on the size of the company, of course. And a lot of times with IoT projects, it can be a startup and they have a particular idea that they think they're going to come to market with. And, yeah. and in a lot of cases, they just don't have all the resources in-house in order to, to implement a, a complex solution like this, right? And um, some of the traps are they you know, trying to find all the different partners that you need, you know, in order to implement the solution um, from, you know, both the hardware design, firmware and mobile app type of thing, right? You know, you need to hire an iOS guy, an Android guy, a backend guy, you know, all, all of these different pieces. And so there's a, a, a big management component. So you can either, you know, try to find a supplier that has all that under one roof or just, just be aware that you're going to have to try to, you know, pick and choose and then also manage and integrate that, right? And, and, and nowadays those teams can also be spread out across different locales and regions. And so, um, you know, you've got your manufacturing partner and you have, you know, your development partner and then what resources do you have in house? Um, if it's a bigger company, they tend to have a lot of that. But, you know, what we also see is when big companies, 
you know, they, they operate in groups that are actually almost like startups and smaller businesses as well, right? So they might not have all of the in-house resources to, to, to do the project. And we just try to figure out, you know, which pieces we can supply for them as part of that and um, kind of just help coach them how to, how, you know, how, what to look out for, right? Because a lot of times the manufacturer might want to do the firmware, but they're not that great at doing the firmware. And, you know, um, there's just a lot of, a lot of traps and, and pitfalls. Sure. That can, yeah, and I think it's important for our audience to understand that they do not need to understand all these pieces themselves. Working with with companies like SoftTech or, you know, a systems integrator, for instance, that I think we've seen over the years, systems integrators becoming very important in IoT um, at any stage of the, of the IoT journey. And so I want to see like Mike and Jeremy, let me get your thoughts here on what, you know, how, what role does a systems integrator kind of play in that development of a team from your perspective? Because oftentimes the company itself cannot do every piece of the IoT project themselves, meaning that they do not build hardware in-house, they do not do connectivity, so they need to partner. So you need to find somebody you, you can trust that's going to help you build the complete solution and make the right decisions along the way for from a cost perspective, from a hardware form, form factor perspective, from a connectivity perspective, based on the information, the data you're trying to um, collect, you know, how frequently you're trying to collect it over, you know, what is the, the, the area you're trying to collect the information over. So, can you talk a little bit about when it comes to assembling that team, the role and um, value systems integrators or companies that at least understand enough of each air component of an IoT solution to be dangerous, really play in success there? Mike, do you want to field that? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> well, mainly when it comes to the uh, identification of what actually the client is needed. Uh, uh, we at SoftTech side, we have like, uh, Chris mentioned we are full stack, so we are capable of closing literally every aspect of the IoT solution, starting from the hardware and in with the manual QA, for example, and that is uh, like one of the most important parts also because at the end uh, you will get the frustrated users, and uh, no matter how good your hardware is, uh, if you get negative scores in the App Store, uh, so there will be no go for your next provisioning. So mainly it's uh, really important to understand uh, what is the real uh, need from the customer uh, depending from the hardware and uh, software parts, uh, especially if they have some demands. For example, they have like some existing system or they would like to incorporate existing hardware with the firmware. We saw all sorts of, all, all sorts of integrations uh, with their hardware, with our hardware, with their firmware, for our hardware, with our backend, with their backend, uh, so just literally everything you can imagine. Uh, and really, it's really much depends on how well do you uh, talk, talk this out with the customer, uh, so he can just, uh, first of all, you just need to gain the trust, uh, and everybody understands what actually is going on. And why do you, are you asking these questions? So just not for the reason you would like to ask them, but you usually explain why uh, do you ask about the backend or some integrations. Uh, this time they often see people asking for the uh, voice assistance integration like Alexa or Google Home or Apple Dot. Uh, but when we start elaborating on this a little bit, uh, usually it comes out that they are not really understanding how they would like to use the Alexa, for example, uh, besides of the simple commands like turn the lights on or turn the lights off. And that's also the part where you have to speak everything out. So I'd say the communication over here is the key to build the correct, uh, the proper team and just to convince your customers that you need this special team for the, for the successful start and finish. Yeah, I, I agree. I think one thing you mentioned there, and Jeremy, you might want to tie on to this, is the trust factor. Is, you know, being able to work with a company and trust them to make the right decisions that help you lead to not just the pilot success, but also to scale success. That's where everyone across the board is going to benefit long term. Well, yeah, I think to, to, to further, you know, support that, it, it, most companies that come to us or are looking at IoT solutions aren't IoT companies. You know, uh, some are like we, we do work with startups that want to build IoT solutions, but I'd say a lot of them are looking to utilize IoT solutions. Um, so their core business is and core competency is not building and deploying and supporting IoT solutions. So what, you know, what we bring is the wealth of experience of having been you know 
been through the those those uh, trials and tribulations before, learn where the traps are, and help guide. Hopefully, help customers avoid you know mistakes uh, and learn and apply that knowledge that we have towards a more productive, more efficient, more effective project. In addition, the two two questions often need to get answered up front: Is this a build or a buy? Mm-hmm. And if you buy it, you know what do I need to build? What do I what can I buy? And, and I think Mike was hitting on that a little bit. And, and we, you know, with a company like SoftTech or others like us, we have a lot of knowledge of what's out there in the market and maybe help guide you towards, you know, the most effective solutions. Yeah, I think that plays into really well into the last root cause that I wanted to discuss, which is the failure to plan properly. So that, you know, all of those questions that you're talking about needing to be answered are usually handled in that planning phase. So can you talk a little bit more about what it means to truly plan properly, you know, why it's so important and also how planning an IoT solution really differs from other technical projects a company may have experienced within the past. Let's say, you know, we want to install a CRM system for, for our team or, or, you know, just other kinds of tools and, and, and technology solutions they may implement. Why IoT planning is so different and what it really means to plan properly. Yeah, so I think, um, you know, when you're talking about kind of the difference between CRM, for instance, and IoT is, is you're, you're talking about with CRM and ERP, typically you're talking about back office functions in accounting, uh, sales. Um, these aren't, aren't things that typically, I mean, obviously your CRM doesn't typically touch your customer. It, it captures data about them, but doesn't touch it. With IoT, your risk exposure essentially is, is, is higher because oftentimes you're deploying IoT solutions to positively, ideally, impact your customer experience to some degree. Obviously, you're looking for internal efficiencies as well, but a lot of times these things are geared towards how do I enrich my customer experience? So um, you are upping the, the ante a little bit on risk for uh, you know bad projects have potentially higher higher uh, higher loss potential uh, for reputation or otherwise um, and, and also uh, you know security is a huge one I, was, I can't be, I'd be, I can't not mention security being one and, and trust you know trusting the system and having your customers trust it so be really you know going back to that complex elements all the different resources what resources do I need you know so what's the business problem what are the what are the questions I need answered? Uh, what are the data sources I have that that exist today and tools I have that can answer those questions? What's the gap in that technology stack to get it? How do I fill that gap with IoT solutions? What capabilities do I need from those IoT solutions? How do I interpret that data? What skill sets do I need to deploy? What do I have internally? What do I need to go from out external? These are all kind of factors that go into it. Yeah. Um, and, and thus, it, it's a you know, it, it, the different. The main difference though is. IoT solutions tend to cross multiple boundaries business-wise and multiple budget cycles. Sure. And you know those two things make it a little bit different than a lot of other I- IT projects. Absolutely, I completely agree. So I guess from your perspective or anyone else welcome to chime in here, what usually leads to that poor planning? Um, you know, is it knowledge, is it experience, is it, um, you know, is there some other factor that kind of leads to these uh, poor planning sessions that maybe you all are brought in to help kind of save or fix? Um, and, and then, you know, I have one other question I want to add on to that, but I want to let, you know, you guys chime in real quick on, on kind of that area. Cause I think it's a lot of that may be relatable to a lot of our audience members experiences they've gone through. Yeah. So before I answer that, that, that question, um, just going back to, to add to, to what Jeremy was saying, you know, the other factor here is hardware, right? So software can be changed very easily. Yes. Uh, so I can put a patch in, 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 in no time, uh, with hardware it takes a lot more planning, mm-hmm. uh, you know, so. I remember back one of the first jobs that I had uh, was um, in a uh, a research lab um, design in my uh, lab that designed uh, eye surgery equipment. Okay. So anytime a change needed to be made, uh, it, it was a new board that had to be designed and it had to be then manufactured and then had to be built. Uh, with software, it's just you know, you, you just make change to code, you deploy, uh, you test it, you deploy, you're, you're good to go. So as far as planning, you know, uh, the difference between uh, IoT and something like a, like a CRM system is, a CRM system is going to be mainly be software. Uh, with IoT, you are, um, you are building software for sure. Uh, you're building hardware. There's also the connectivity layer between the hardware and the, in, in the cloud typically. Uh, and, and those last two uh, components, uh, 
require a lot more planning than yeah. traditional software uh, because your delivery cycles are different, your manufacturing cycles are different. Uh, even think about this, even, even with wireless technologies, right? I may develop a product here for the US uh, that uh, using a particular band, a radio band that just will not work in, in Europe, mm -hmm. right? So, so those things need to be planned ahead um, and the consequences are that your product won't work uh, in, in, in another uh, geography. So um, now as, as far as like why um, people fail to plan, I, I think it's, uh, I, I think part of it, it could be the, you know, the maturity model uh, the, 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 where the company is uh, within IoT. IoT is still fairly new uh, in mm -hmm. this new version, right? Uh, IoT in the, in the form of machine to machine has been around uh, for, for many years now, but in this new form, it's fairly, relatively new. Uh, so people are just starting to figure things out, right? So, uh, you know, well, one idea is that uh, don't, don't be too hard on yourself uh, if, 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 if you find uh, projects uh, being delayed for for lack of planning or uh, or you miss a step or or, or two um, you know you this is fairly new still for for a lot of companies uh, and and companies are, are still figuring out the the uh, the idea is to be agile in your in your development in in in, in the process of being willing to take a pivot um, uh, to to address uh, things that were missed uh, and 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 keep moving forward. Um, but um, but yeah, um, I, I guess from I'm trying to think of, of particular customer scenarios um, around planning. It's it's just the maturity of the organization that 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 might be lacking there, uh, which would affect any project, uh, mm -hmm. not just IoT. With IoT, it might be amplified because of the things that I mentioned earlier with with hardware and connectivity that Absolutely. that often are missed. That's a good point from Danny about the hardware because hardware is definitely different, right? Mm -hmm. I worked hard, as they say. So, you know, as far as planning, of course, scope creep, like we, we mentioned earlier, right? I mean, that's related to planning, but then planning uh, from the standpoint of keeping scalability in mind, you know, if you're IoT solution, you know, once you do have a bunch of these devices out there, how are you going to support that scale? Um, security, for example, failure to plan uh, to, to make your device secure. And then also pl failing to plan to uh, to make your make sure your devices are updatable in the field. I mean, yep. you won't be able to change the hardware, but you might have to change the firmware, right? So how do you actually update all these devices out in the field? And a lot of companies will skip that step because it is an extra added cost. But once you get trapped and you've got some bug out there, now you have no way to fix it. You know? Absolutely, yeah. I, th I think one of the, one of the big takeaways I'm, I'm kind of gathering from all these um, these points here um, is that. The, that planning phase uh, is very important in order to avoid those common pitfalls and to understand what you're getting into before you go down it. Because we're, the goal here is not to make IoT sound like a daunting thing because the, the, um, the benefits truly outweigh the time and the challenges that are often associated with IoT that we're talking about here. But I know there are, you know, there is definitely an approach and there are ways to avoid those pitfalls and those problems by doing better planning up front uh, across the board in all areas, whether it's hardware, whether it's connectivity, software, the whole project in and of itself. And I wanted to bring Mike in here and talk a little bit more about the importance of that planning phase, or I, I know from our discussion, you guys call it the discovery phase, it really sets things up for success from the efficiency perspective. So, so Mike, can you dive a bit more into what the discovery phase really is for a new project. You know, take us through how you all at Soft Tech kind of approach the discovery phase. What deliverables often look like? You know, how long does that process take? And overall, just like what the true benefit and value you get on why and this why this is not a phase that you should ever overlook because it's super critical to the success of all stages of the rest of the journey you're going down. Yeah, sure. So regarding the discovery phase and how we are doing it at SoftTech, so this is like uh, usually the first phase of the project. Um, at this phase, we are uh, trying to identify the business goals and needs of the customer. And actually, it's like the uh, two-way two, two -way communication. So like if that, if that is a customer who is not really familiar to the IoT, he can learn from this discovery phase uh, more details about how uh, points uh, that are in, of interest to him are being made. 
Uh, also, for this, uh, for this phase, I'd say that communication is a key to success. Uh, so I believe that the best uh, efficiency here is the face-to-face -face meetings when you are on site and talking day-to-day uh, -day with a customer and have, have all the time with that you might need. So you have the lunch talks, uh, whatever. So you can just show everything on your laptop or ask uh, directly. It's really, really, really much more efficient. Though in these uh, hard COVID times, it's really not an option right now, but I believe for one day we'll return back to normal life. Yeah, so when it comes next to the uh, like planning uh, during the discovery phase, uh, what you actually can achieve over here is like uh, you can, uh, customer can completely change their minds upon the discovery phases ongoing. It really takes uh, uh, like uh, somewhere about a month. It depends, uh, it can be more, it can be less, but uh, we can stick to the number about a month. And when it actually happens, uh, there was one case when customer wanted a huge cloud solution with lots of, uh, lots of functionality and features that he wanted. But gradually upon our discussions and uh, showing him the weak points of the solution and the points that probably he might never need, uh, we turned out to have the smaller, much smaller solution that was including only the mobile application. And, but the important thing here was that customer was absolutely happy with this solution. And that was really what he wanted. Uh, and without this phase, we definitely would be going with building the huge uh, cloud solution that would never, uh, probably never hit the market. Or if it will, it will be really uh, a disaster for customer in the next, in the next uh, years. So, uh, like this, uh, the, uh, what we produce at the end of discovery is it's called a vision and scope document. It's uh, the document that actually describes the overall uh, overall features that customer would like to see in the in, in the end product. Though it's not like uh, highly detailed, it's like more of, of, of an overview, like uh, the high level one, because usually uh, discovery phase is fo followed by a business analysis phase that gets the uh, drill down to the user stories, exact user stories over there. So uh, what I'm thinking right now is like a great example from Chris before about the hardware and uh, updatability of the hardware and firmware. Uh, one of the cases we faced, one of our clients came to us with the existing problem uh, where they started project without the proper discovery phase beforehand. And they ended up with the thousands of devices uh, uh, left at the warehouses and they were not able to deliver them to the stores because uh, they got really low ratings in the app store uh, because there was a pairing problem and they could not fix it uh, without uh, pair it first. And it was really like a situation where you could not make any move because they can, could not manually update all those devices uh, to, get, to gain the customer success mm -hmm. and they could not deliver it to the market. So it was like a total loss. And I definitely think that uh, we should avoid, companies should avoid uh, doing such huge risks and uh, conduct discovery phase beforehand. Uh, so I just want to mention that we will share the comprehensive document at the end of the session so everybody can take a look at it and uh, just to get to know more about what I'm talking about. That's awesome. Yeah, I have a queued up in the chat. I'm going to share it real quick so our audience has, uh, has a link to kind of check out the discovery phase. But before we get into question and answer real quick, Jeremy, I wanted to bring you in and ask you about those deliverables that come out of that discovery phase. You know, how, what other ways can they be used as far as can they be used for let's say RFPs to better kind of scope and uh, the costs or scope and cost of projects, you know, what other ways are you seeing the value of the discovery phase, not just in the pure planning of it, let's say, but um, you know, what are they kind of the multi uses that people are getting out of the discovery phase to kind of add extra value? I think it's invaluable because it helps establish, you know, first of all, that roadmap of think big, but plan sure. to start small. Right. Um, so it, it, it helps answer questions around, uh, you know, first of all, am I going the right direction? Does this look like, you know, I had an idea, this, the, the project plan, we had an outline at some point, probably started with an outline uh, based on the, after going through the discovery phase, does it validate that, that vision or not? And do we need to adjust? Yeah. Second is from a budget standpoint, we've seen it be invaluable towards budgeting because sometimes people budget, hey, this is gonna be a $10 million project. Well, actually, no, it's gonna cost you about two. Yeah. Or we've seen probably more often than not the other where, you know, if you, if you plan to, you know, you think, oh, it's going to be a million dollar project, let's budget that, 
you find out it's going to be a $5 million project. Um, another reason these things fail, but uh, so for budgeting, uh, for finance, also for resource allocations, what resources do I really need? Uh, and this will help identify what resources do I have? What resources do I need? What's that gap? To help staff these pro uh, uh, programs and projects. Um, and then the last one is I think, you know, what subject matter expertise do I need? A lot of times wh where the customer value comes into play with companies like us, we're experts on kind of IoT, the software, the hardware, and things like that. We're typically not domain experts in our customers' businesses. Yes. And that that's a role that I think, you know, understanding, hey, what is the business's role in these projects? Because by the way, if you don't have the business in, that's another reason a lot of these things fail. Um, what role do they play? How much do we need? And, yes. and I think those discovery phases really, the output from discovery phases really help kind of provide you, uh, our customers the framework to help inform them of those types of questions. Yeah, I totally agree. I think it's something that's often overlooked is um, the domain experience and understanding that most customers have coming into it, but oftentimes the IoT development company or the systems integrator does not have. So they're oftentimes learning about industries they have no connection to or any experience with, but it is very important that they understand that and that also the customer understands that that knowledge and experience is vital to the success of a project when it comes to building and planning during that discovery phase. And it's something that I think is sometimes often overlooked. Um, but to your point, you know, that is probably the area where most companies that are helping build the solution, you know, they lack that domain experience. And that's where we're really relying on the customer to share everything they can to better understand it. Cause that's the best way to solve it. Especially when you're working from that business case or that end user backwards and not leading with technology. So, um, so yeah, that, that's all fantastic. I think this, you know, this conversation so far has been great. I wanted to, I know we have about nine minutes left and I wanted to make sure we did not leave these questions because there are a number of questions that have come through, which is fantastic. So um, unless there's anything else to add, I'm going to go ahead and jump right into the questions. Um, and you know, feel free to just jump in and answer uh, anyone who would like to, uh, feels like they'd like to, to field it. The first question we have is, um, what's the best way to deal with all the different wireless protocols out there and how can I future-proof my solution? Chris, thoughts? Well, I mean, I don't know if Mike has a comment, but yeah, I mean, definitely it's a concern. I mean, the the the, um, the thing now is that a lot of these chips, these wireless chips, have a lot of those different protocols on them already, right? You know, so you're gonna have if you, uh, you, but you do need to understand whether you really need 5G support, right? Because maybe you only need something like 3G or 4G, depending on where you are, and like Danny said before, depending on your region. So you know, uh, whether you need it, you know, uh, what's your lifetime of your IOT project? You know, does, is it really going to be around for five more years or not? Because then it doesn't really matter um, later, right? Um, also upgradability, you know, sometimes a lot of these, these chips can be upgraded um, to support additional protocols. But um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's really, again, just kind of looking at the hardware and the need and the, and the lifetime of the device. Um, would be my recommendation because you want to add that cost if you don't need it. You yeah, know, just totally. just five G just because, right? You know, it's, like, it's a waste. Absolutely. Um, let me let me go ahead and keep keep running through these. So the second question comes in from Calum. He says, "What should customers expect to take on themselves versus rely on the vendor or the partners for?" So asking especially for companies that are just starting to adopt IoT and may not know everything that's required for success. Would love it if you could use a real world example to make it more real uh, for that. So, Chris, Danny, what do you want to want to kind of jump in and talk I'll, a little bit? About? Yeah, I'll, I'll answer part of that, and then I'm sure the other folks will, will, will can, can add to it. But you know, the, the first thing I, I would say is, don't try to build it all uh, from from scratch, right? I um, I see many companies that say, well, we have the talent. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to use. Uh, a service like, for instance, in the case of of, of, of Microsoft, you know, we, we provide a a service called Azure IoT Hub, mm -hmm. uh, which is a think of it as a cloud gateway that allows you to connect your devices to the cloud. Um, you know, a, a smart engineering team can definitely build a service like that, um, but but why do it, right? Why why you know build something from scratch? You know, take so I would say take advantage of, of products you know like IoT uh, IoT Hub. Um, and we we have another one called IoT Central that allows you to very easily. Know, create um, IoT solutions without having um, 
uh, to spend that much time on the uh, on the coding is not for every solution, uh, but but definitely to get started, it, it, it could help. Um, so that would be my 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 first you know, my first answer. There is, is don't don't build it all on your own. Focus on the business need and not on the plumbing. Yeah, I, I agree with you. That's that's great. Anyone else want to add in there before I get into the next question? Well, just yeah. from the of what they need to. to I'm sorry, Jeremy. What they need. To to provide it's more of that it is that business expertise right it is it is that subject matter expertise that you know we need and then that's why our business analysts get involved to kind of get that from them and then apply it to what we know about the iot space absolutely that's exactly what i was going to say <laughs> all right perfect all right next next question says have you um seen any projects fail because maybe too many people are involved in the pr planning process <laughs> Yes. Again, think about, you know, agile. Agile is, is, is uh, you know, I think what Chris talked about is iterative can be applied to what we in the development world refer to as agile. Um, and, and I think the idea is that, you know, uh, big teams make big decisions slowly. Um, and then, you know, the, the results of those big decisions and big projects that you, when you get too many people, oftentimes you get scope creep, you get a lot, you, you try to solve world hunger with it. So, you know, maybe plan for an outcome or a business problem that's uh, like we said in the beginning, you know, plan big, but then start small, figure out what are subsets of those problems and, and what questions you want to answer towards solving those problems that can be digestible from a small team so you can move quickly. Most people don't want to, you know, I, I agree with the ROI statement that, you know, I came from 17 years in cybersecurity where, you know, providing an ROI in cybersecurity is, is challenging, let's just say. And IoT, sometimes it can be just, you have to do it because if you don't do it, something happens. The same with cybersecurity. So just think through, instead of the cost and in, in getting all the benefit analysis for what business stakeholders you need, what do you need to do? Who needs to be involved to make those decisions? Is there a small subset of decision makers you can do to move agilely and then move ahead with it that way? Okay, awesome. Uh, next question, we kind of touched on this briefly, but it says, I've heard proof of concept, I've heard MVP, pilot, prototype, all used. A um, bit confused on between them. Um, can you please try and explain the typical steps in that successful IoT journey and maybe kind of the differences as briefly as we can? So we can. Yeah, so I'll answer this one. So mainly, the, there are like probably two types of these uh, prototyping phases. The one, as uh, Danny mentioned, is the throwaway proof, proof of concept, uh, when you just have to figure out if it's even feasible or not. Like if you don't know if this uh, board will be capable of using your firmware or if it's capable of uh, providing you exact RTC clock or is it capable of connecting to the uh, MQTT uh, broker or whatever. When it comes to the second, like MVP or pilot, uh, well, pilot is like more shaped prototypes that can move forward. MVP is really the minimum viable product where you can really uh, deliver it to market and you can deliver it to customers uh, without any issues. But it will be really, uh, it will lack some functionality, but you will be able to update it later on with the firmware and software updates. Okay. So these are like main parts. When you have the POC, you just want to check if it's feasible enough. If you have pilot, you know probably it will be feasible, but you want to move further forward, but you are not having enough budget for that. If you have an MVP, it's more like you don't have enough budget for the full project, but you have uh, for money for part of it. And then you can actually uh, deliver it to the market and uh, also gain back the response from users and see how you can move forward like that. So it's like those are the main points over there. Right. Okay, great. Looks like we have a ton of questions still coming in. I know we only have a few minutes left, so I'm just going to pick a couple here. If we go over a few minutes, we'll maybe do that, and then we can find a way to answer these questions for for the for the remainder of um, or the remaining questions. So, what what um, this question is from Abdul? He says, "What kind of expectations do companies have before engaging as far as ROI?" Uh, I mean, that varies. Uh, you know, depends on the project. And again, one of the first questions that I think really needs to be asked is, should we be looking at this as an ROI or should we be looking at this as an investment um, in, in, in improving our business? And, and then, then you can back in again to the size of the problem and, and so on and so forth and the business problem back. Okay, great. Um, what are some common pitfalls of using off-the-shelf hardware versus, or for a proof of concept and then transitioning to custom hardware? 
when moving to scale. So what tips do you have on addressing those challenges and mitigating risks associated with that piece of the process? Uh, uh, you know, what I've seen in the past is, is that you, you, you start mimicking and looking at functionality uh, and you also look at the cost of what's it going to cost to develop that functionality and features that are included in the off the shelf versus what if I buy it. And then most important, a lot of people miss is what's the cost of supporting it thereafter. It's one thing to build it. The next thing is to support it. So the question of who's going to support it, how's it going to be supported, how much will that cost? versus buying something off the shelf and having that, you know, those support costs, those things are things that need to be considered. Yeah, and I would also uh, add a little bit on that. So when it comes to the off the shelf hardware, usually it's easy to start and easy to build a prototype and probably easy to build some sort of MVP. But when it comes to really large, large project, you will uh, eventually find yourself in the situation where you are, you are spending too much efforts just for supporting this incorrect hardware that was chosen from the beginning, because you, you are just cannot change it anymore. And you just need to build more and more workarounds just to achieve the goals and features. And that's where it will be really hard for you to change uh, back to the custom hardware because you've like already have the full, full lineup and you have to issue another version and you have to support both of them at the same time. So that's really might be challenging. Absolutely. Now, before we get into these last couple of questions here, I wanted to share the poll results. Um, so when developing an IoT project, which, which issue is most concerned? It seems like over 50% say establishing a business case uh, with executive buy-in. So I just thought that was really interesting to share. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing those. Um, this other question I thought was really interesting. So when you approach the budgeting piece of an IoT solution, um, oftentimes companies don't know what they don't know. So um, it's really difficult to know how much to budget and resources to request for a project. So what's your just general advice there on that topic? Conduct the discovery oh, phase. Every phase comes in, right, Mike? Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, yeah, no, that's the perfect easy answer there. Um, a reminder, I did, did share the, um, the link to the discovery phase overview in the chat for those interested in checking it out. Um, it says, let's see, the next question says, and regarding time frame, management wants to know a timeline. How should they tackle this question? Discovery phase, I hate to keep going back to that, but again, you know, these are all the great questions that need to be answered that can be helped answered by a minimal investment in the discovery phase. Um, yeah, that, that's, I, I agree. Discovery phase is probably gonna be the answer for a lot of these, which is, you know, it's good that there's, so there's firm that will, you know, definitely solve this problem. Um, next question is, what best practices are there for training the customer or personnel on a new IoT solution, especially if they're completely new to IoT or in a traditionally low tech industry? Talking more about those end users. I think Microsoft, I mean, you know, with their experience and breadth and, and infrastructure and capabilities would be one place to go. A lot of tools that they have available um, that are, are helpful and educational. Um, also talk to your salespeople. Um, you know, I know a lot of people have a, a bad taste in their mouth sometimes about salespeople, but salespeople can bring in the right resources to help educate you. And I'm sure would have a, uh, it would be happy to help educate you. Uh, anyway. So you, so you answered that, I guess, that question now. We, we just announced this morning, so I don't have a lot of the details, but a pretty big initiative around the training the next generation of uh, uh, people uh, to, to embrace the, the, the new digital economy. Uh, so it's a response to, to the current COVID situation, obviously, but, uh, but it's something that, that is available and we, we are partnering up with you know, our three companies, you know, LinkedIn, uh, uh, GitHub, uh, and obviously Microsoft uh, to, to come uh, to, to, to provide a set of resources for, for consumers. So um, you can check that announcement. Um, I, I don't have a, a link because it was literally today that, that I just heard about it, but that might be a place to go in if you want to get some training um, and, 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 and train your staff in, in this new economy. That's great. Um, another question here is, so what will happen if there's no support from top management during the development phase? Like after we've gotten through the pilot, you know, say the upper management just doesn't buy in. And is that usually, we were obviously saying that that's usually why projects fail, but uh, do you see any other kind of issues um, with, with no support from top management? I mean, if, if, if there's no support, then uh, you end up, you know, you, uh, who, who owns it, right? So, so you start getting uh, in, in the company conflicts as to, no, you know, I'm responsible for the project or no, this other person is responsible for it. 
uh, there's scope creep uh, happening, a lack of support, a lack of funding. So the minute that any particular barrier uh, gets hit, and you're going to hit barriers, uh, that, that, that's inevitable. Um, but then the project just, just dies. Sure. Um, and that, that's, that's been the biggest thing that I've seen when you, when you don't have that, that sponsorship. Now, you could, if, if you have a, depending on the, the way your, your department might, might be structured, you could put it off. Right, you could put off a uh, 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 MVP um, that is good enough to, you know, to, to, to show to customers and, and get started. Maybe that leads to to more uh, executive buy-in. But uh, if you don't have it, uh, things just become very chaotic, and it's really hard to move it uh, to move forward. It's almost like dragging a project uphill, you know, trying to to keep it alive. Uh, uh, even if it's a good idea, if you don't have that sponsorship, it just, it, it just, I, imagine now too, right? The economy just literally went the other way. Uh, I just, just took it. There was a big uh, barrier there. If you didn't have that sponsorship, these projects, these projects die, right? Or, or get postponed. Yeah, I agree, Danny. But one, one other thing, if I can just interject is understanding why, why you don't have the buy-in and seeing if you can sure. gather the right metrics to either reapproach or not. Absolutely. Yep, for sure. We still have a number of questions, but I'm just going to pick one more to, before as we wrap up. This question came in from Rick. He asked, when customers are entertaining an IoT or digital transformation strategy, what are the three biggest obstacles in getting the customer to the table to discuss the necessity of an enterprise-level IoT cloud platform solution? I think, uh, Chris, I don't want to talk too much. You're on mute. <laughs> You're on mute, Chris. You're on mute, Chris. I was going to kick it over to Danny, actually, from an enterprise cloud standpoint. Um, it sounded like he wanted that. Yeah, yeah. I was actually trying to look at the question because I didn't, I didn't fully underst understood it when, when you answered. So, can you ask it again? Sure. When customers are entertaining an IoT or digital transformation strategy, what are the three biggest obstacles in getting the customer to the table to discuss the necessity of an enterprise level IoT cloud platform solution? Oh man, <laughs> that's a just like high level. Just you know, any kind of advice you have there. You know, we uh, one of the things that we do. Uh, so the soft tech uh, talked about that discovery phase. One of the things that we do uh, at our MTCs, uh, Microsoft Technology Centers, so when we do engagements, and these are typically two to three day you know, deep dive into a particular problem. You know, we we like to really do what we call the um, uh, mutual discovery, right? So we spend about half a day. Just learn, uh, getting to know um, the the business better and letting the business talk to one another, because many times that's the first time that these business these these organizations within the enterprise are talking to one another, right? right? So to trying to to get them into the table, and then uh, one of the questions that I'll typically ask is, you now what happens if you don't solve this problem, sure. right? And 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 then we'll give you the answer, right? Um, you know, it typically we we'll say, well, if 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 we don't get address this, we're gonna our customer satisfaction is gonna go down the, you know, it's gonna go down, or our production cost is gonna increase, or whatever it might be. And then you just take that information uh, that they're giving you, basically, uh, to come back to them and say, well, at the end of the day, right? So after you know we finish the three day uh, engagement, you know, this is why you should move forward with this, right? Because this 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 is the reason in your own words. You describe the problem, and you describe you know what happens if we don't solve the problem. So the you know the best advice that I can give people is get the business to to articulate the problem themselves, and mm -hmm. then what happens if they don't fix it, right? And then use that to get them to fix it, right? Uh, what is if, that? If, what is that problem? What is the problem worth to you? Exactly. Yeah, absolutely, I totally agree. Um, but thank you. Um, yeah, but thank you all for, for all these insights today. I'm going to wrap, go ahead and wrap up here. We still have some more questions. I'll, we'll pass them over to SoftTech and SoftTech can um, find a way to kind of engage with those who asked um, and maybe, you know, post some stuff on social media or something just to kind of answer those remaining questions since we're over our time by about 10 minutes here. Um, but uh, Chris, let me, this last thing I wanted to pass to you is, is people out there have more questions about SoftTech, want to connect with you. I saw some messages in that came in actually through the question that seemed to really appreciate your guys' time and your insights and they plan to reach out to SoftTech. So what's the best way to do that? 
Yeah, I mean, uh, definitely just go to softtech.com. You know, we've got a chat bot there. We have a contact form. Someone will get back with you right away. And obviously, we've been giving the link there, too, also to the discovery phase document that you want to take a look at. That's usually the best way. Happy to talk to you and answer your questions directly. No problem. Wonderful. Thank you, Chris, Mike, Jeremy, Danny. It's been, been a pleasure to kind of talk with you all more and more about, you know, IoT solutions and why we're often seeing them, them fail in, in a lot of different scenarios. But, you know, like we've talked about, there are teams at SoftTech, at Microsoft, and a lot of other companies here that can, that, that understand the different pieces of an IoT solution. And, and we're not trying to paint this as IoT is hard, so don't even explore it. We're trying to explain that IoT is one of the, you know, it's like that next step in digital transformation that we all believe in. And there are people out there who can help. Um, so, so again, thank you guys for your time. If for the audience members out there, if you have questions, feel free to go check out softtech.com, S-O-F-T-E-Q.com um, for more information about softtech. Um, if you're out there, hopefully you've checked out IoT for all as well. If you have not, you're interested in being a partner like softtech, feel free to reach out to us. Um, but other than that, thank you all for your time. We appreciate you being here today to share your insights. And, um, you know, we look forward to any follow-up anybody out there has. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye.